to the Toxic Google event. I'm Mindy, and I lead the kids and family work here for Google. I am very excited to introduce today's guest, Andy Cohen. Andy Cohen is best known as the host and executive producer of Emmy-nominated Watch What Happens Live with Andy Cohen, Bravo's late night interactive talk show, and an executive producer of the Real Housewives franchise. Cohen serves as an executive producer on over 11 properties across NBC Universal. He also has two personally curated channels on Sirius XM, Radio Andy, and Andy Cohen's Kiki Lounge, and his own book imprint, Andy Cohen Books. He has been a New York Times bestselling author five times, and he is here to discuss his journey, career, and most recent book titled The Daddy Diaries, The Year I Grew Up. Cohen resides in New York City with his son, Benjamin Cohen and Lucy Cohen. Andy, it is my pleasure to welcome you to Talks at Google. Thanks for having me. I really want to know if she let her son wear the Spider-Man outfit to school. I need the end of that story. It's a, <laughs> it's a very good question. Yeah. Very good question. Andy, it's so good to have you here. We're thrilled to dig in and talk about Daddy Diaries. I, if folks haven't read the book, you need to get it. You also need to listen to By it. By the way, she did let him wear it to school. And oh, I she did. Okay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's a very good decision. Very good decision. So tell us about the battles. genesis. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So tell us about the genesis of Daddy Diaries. How did you come about um, wanting to write this book? Like what brought it on for you? I had written two other diaries, one called the Andy Cohen Diaries and one called Superficial. And I had given up the diary format, but then, um, you know, I was starting to, David Sedaris published uh, some, some diaries, which intrigued me. And then I thought my life is so different than it was the last time I wrote um, uh, one of these. And I thought, let me just write a month and see what that looks like and um, decide whether I'm going to keep going and, and publish it. And I, I, I wrote a month's work and it's worth and it starts with New Year's Eve with Anderson and I, me getting highly inebriated and going off <laughs> on the mayor of New York City on CNN and the, you know, the month was, was busy and dramatic. And there was so much about um, raising Ben and Lucy was on the way. And I thought this is, this is going to be good. So I continued and here we, here we are. I mean, what a delight it is. It's, I mean, it's hilarious. Like, first of all, you kind of get a, a sneak peek into your life um, and the daily ins and outs. Yeah. Um, you talk a lot about, and I've seen in post interviews as well, how you've matured since having kids and that you actually started that journey before Ben was born. Can you tell us how, how did you know you were ready for kids? Like what brought about that for you? Well, I think I was at a place professionally in my life where I was where I wanted to be and I didn't feel like, oh, you know, and I think that's important and I think it's hard because, um, uh, you know, a lot of us are battling um, a biological time clock. And that's also why I urge people who can, um, who are willing and able to freeze their eggs so that they have more of a choice about when they have kids. Science is a beautiful thing. Um, and, you know, I was, I was approaching 50, frankly, and I just thought, well, I am where I want to be you know, in my career, I also had published these two books and I thought, how many more parties can I go to? How many more, you know, <laughs> like, is my whole life going to be defined by my profession or, you know, what, what am I going to have to look back at in 10 or 15 years? Um, and so I just, I just had, I just had those discussions with myself and I had always in my mind thought that I wanted to be a parent, but I wasn't sure, you know, if I would, you know, I was never ready. And I just felt like with this big age approaching, um, I was financially okay to do it. And, and I said, I'm, I'm going to do it. I mean, you talk, it's such a wonderful example of your journey and the book about it. And how did you, did you feel like you had to make compromises along the way? Like what were some trade-offs, like, as you made that decision, like, okay, I, this is what I'm going to give up in order to take this. Oh, my God. Well, I mean, I gave up complete <laughs> freedom. I had complete yeah. freedom. Yeah. 
my life. I, I mean, I, I it is, it is, I am shackled. I mean, they're beautiful <laughs> shackles, but shackled the nonetheless. Shackles. Yeah. You know, and every day, you know, there are days where I'm like, what the hell did I do? You know, and mainly I will say I, I'm I'm even on those days, I know that I did the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I can't imagine, you know, I just finished a house that I built at the beach and it's so beautiful. And, you know, even this summer in the roughest of times, I have a four and a half year old and a one and a half year old and I'm a single parent. And even in the roughest of days, I thought to myself, you know, this house would be very empty if you were here mm -hmm. alone. It would just, what would the point of it be? So, mm -hmm. um, so I, I know that I, I feel good about what I did. Yeah. I can't remember what your question was, but. Oh, just about the compromises and like, like what, what did you give up for it? And then yes. you, you're like, I gave up my freedom. <laughs> yeah, I gave up <laughs> my free. So yes, true. I gave up my yeah. complete freedom. And, you know, there are times where I'm scrolling through Instagram at Christmas time and I'm seeing all these people on islands in swimsuits. And, you know, I'm not, I, I you know, in my mind, I'm like, look, it's kind of a pain in the butt right now to travel with two infants. Like, is, is this... What, is this going to be fun for me? I make a lot of right. those choices. And is it really going to be fun for them? Or maybe are they more comfortable right at this moment kind of here? And so right. I do make a lot of those choices. But, you know, you have FOMO sometimes. But that's okay. Yeah. FOMO I mean, you talk is about, okay. You talk about in the book going from uh, the switch from vacations to trips <laughs> that you learned um, that it's, yeah, that kind of come to Jesus when I had three weeks off and each and I just was very um, I, I was very I was having a rough time with them and uh, it was it was rough. I w I'm happy to say this summer was so much better. It was. I had a better grip on it. And I think that it, it was just a better experience. It felt kind of like a vacation. <laughs> That's good. Progressing that direction. Yes. Yes. Um, so t tell us, I guess, so how has managing all the Bravo talents helped prepare you for parenthood? Well, I'm used to childish behavior, I guess. <laughs> But I think, you know, and I think it's allowed me to be patient. I actually think I'm a little better with them, with the housewives, now that I've been negotiating with oh, that's my, interesting. my terrorist <laughs> uh, four and a half year old. So how, how has that helped you with the housewives? I think it's helped. I think having a toddler is an exercise in patience. And I think it's mm. an exercise in figuring out what's important and figuring out, um, you know, how upset you're going to get. I mean, I, you know, part of the, I, I'm stunned by the level of emotion coming out of my four and a half year old on any given day about something completely ridiculous that I truly have to take deep breaths and say, okay, do not engage just, you know, and so I feel like with the housewives, I am, you know, I, I'm I'm a little more of a dad now in those reunions than I was before. I have my moments where I break. I mean, at the last Jersey reunion, I was pushed to the brink. <laughs> and, um, you know, and by the way, every, you know, I'm pushed to the brink with the kids sometimes and I don't react. I don't. I, I really try to have non-reactions, but it's so hard. And I'm a highly reactive person as my mom <laughs> is. And so um, it's an exercise in trying to keep my shit together, if I can say that. <laughs> I think we can all, uh, we can all feel that in our core. <laughs> How do we keep yeah. it together? So, so much of your life is in the public eye, obviously, and your entire career. So how has that changed now since you've had Ben and Lucy? Well, I mean, I'm still in the public eye. I think I have to kind of uh, 
I'm negotiating in my own mind how much I want to share of my kids on social media. Lucy came to watch What Happens Live yesterday for the first time, and I'm dying to post this super cute picture of us there. And I feel like in the next six months, I'll stop posting her. I now only post Ben's voice. Um mm -hmm. I just out of respect for him, and I may be kind of on the way out of that. And I know people have really responded to me posting conversations I have with him on the way to camp and stuff. And it is relatable, but I'm very, very concerned about mm. the fact that he didn't sign up to be on my Instagram. And yep. you know, so one thing I'm curious about is how how do you go about making the decisions on like how you protect their privacy or like the, your trade-offs there? Like, I'm only going to hear his voice. I've seen your Instagrams are so adorable and his little background conversation or meltdown or something like that. Um, I'm just curious, like, how do you go about making those trade-offs and like protecting them from the negativity that can come? Well, that's what I'm doing now. I mean, I'm, you know, I, I, there was a threshold where I stopped showing Ben's face on social media mm -hmm. and now you can hear his voice and I'm inching away from that even. Mm -hmm. And Lucy, I think when she's, you know, about two, I'll stop posting her as well. Yeah. It's got to be such a tricky balance to, for you as well with such a public life. Yeah. yeah. So you did some publicity during your book tour um, and book release where you came back to look ag again and re-explain some of the events in the book with two kids. Now that you've had a chance to look back even further, what, if anything, would you have done differently? In terms of like looking back over that year of Daddy Diaries, um, like looking back, you know, you're like, oh man, maybe I should have done that differently. Um, was there anything that you, from that year, you would have tried differently? You know... I'm not, I'm a firm believer in letting your mistakes inform your next decisions. So I certainly made a lot of mistakes, but I think they just made me a better parent. I think we have to lean into our mistakes and then we don't make them again, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's a, that's a great answer because I think normalizing that, hey, we've all got mistakes and we all have issues. Yeah. So what is your biggest parenting challenge you're facing right now? just time management and um, time management. I think my biggest, I think for me, it's prioritizing Lucy because Ben, she can't, she's, you know, she says data, that's all she says. And I, you know, Ben, because he can speak is so much more demanding of his time because he can express himself and say, I want this, this, and this you know, and I'm trying to get his behavior together. And so he's more demanding. And so for me, it's, it's being there more for her. Um, that's my biggest challenge mm. right now. Being a single parent mm. is not for the faint of heart. Even yeah. as much help as I have, you know, you're still their only person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so w one thing that I know a lot of the folks around Google after reading your book ask a lot of questions about just how do you balance it all, the work-life balance. So kind of leaning into that, you, you share some really delightful, like quiet moments with your kids in the book that are just pure delight and joy. What sort of advice do you have for busy parents who feel like their professions may keep them from having enough of those moments? Um, well, just prioritize what you have to do and make what you really, you know, you have to figure out, it's like we were talking about picking your battles earlier. It's like picking your, you know, what is the most important thing that I have to do today? How can I be there for my kids today? Sometimes, you know, yesterday I had a super busy day, um, but I was able to be with Ben for like 90 minutes in the morning and then um, I was able to wake Lucy up and spend a half hour reading to her before I went to work. And then I figured out kind of towards the end of the day, oh, wait, I have a half hour at work. And I was able to um, have my nanny bring Lucy to see me at work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's just kind of figuring out pockets of time and pockets of opportunity. And also, I think a huge thing is don't beat yourself up. For me, it's like if you, if you know, 
Focus on what you can do and don't beat yourself up because you have to be there again tomorrow. And, mm. you know, I think we as parents give ourselves such a hard time and it's so hard already. It's like, give yourself a break. And we're trying to do everything right. You know what? If they wouldn't eat the broccoli, but they ate the hot dog, then you know what? Tomorrow's a new day. I think yeah. about all the crap I ate as a child. I refused <laughs> to eat a vegetable until I was like 18. So when I remembered that a few weeks ago, I was like, what am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> you survive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think you also talked about Ben finally eating a hot dog bun in the in the book you got you got him all the way yes. up till the yes. bun and then he finally he, he crossed the line there so yeah. we're all a work in progress so thinking about like how you manage work life balance you talked about this a little bit but what changed for you going from one to two kids and it's uh, obviously adds a lot more um just curious like what are some of those dynamics for you oh my gosh i mean it just felt heavier. I mean, with one, you kind of, I kind of felt like I had it under control. It's just, and it's only more and more. I mean, it's, it, it's just exponentially, you know, but also I did it for him. I'm an older dad mm -hmm. and I wanted him to have a person, you know, that person. Mm -hmm. I want him to have a family. And the great thing is that, you know, I, I know that I've spent way more time with him when he was, the only one here that I spent with her during her kind of first year, but also she got to spend so much time with her brother who was in mm. her face, talking to her, trying to show her things, whatever. So that's a positive. So there are, there are, um, there are pros and cons of everything that, that we do as parents. And it's, it's another reason why you just kind of have to breathe through this stuff. Yeah. So a little bit of a pivot of a question, but curious minds want to know, how do you think, how does Ben describe your job? I don't know. He knows there are great snacks at Watch What Happens. <laughs> um, and there are a lot of buttons to push in the control room. I mean, he gets there, he, he goes to the snack table and then to the control room because my director lets him push a lot of buttons. And... Um, so I don't know if he, I don't know. He, he, and there's a thing in the book where um, we were listening, my, my music channel on Sirius is called Andy's Kiki Lounge. And we were listening to it over the summer a lot last summer. And I come on all the time and, and or my name is mentioned all the time. And he said at one point, he turned to me by the pool. He goes, are you Andy Cohen? <laughs> And yeah. I said, yeah. And now he said, I think he thinks my job is like being Andy Cohen. He thinks it's so I funny mean, to call me Andy Cohen. So, I mean, it is kind of your job, though. It kind he's, of is. He's not wrong. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you want your kids to say about your work when they grow up? Um, I hope they say that I made people happy mm -hmm. and that, you know, that, as busy as I was, that I was around for them. Mm -hmm. I hope. Yeah. That would be a great thing. I think all of us would like. Um, yeah. So you talk a lot about your parents in the book and your mom cracks me up, like in her heckling behind backstage or about shows. It's just such, it's so funny. Um, you're obviously close to them. You're also at the age where many of us are in that sandwich generation, caretaking both children and parents. Have you thought about what sort of responsibilities you might have to take on with for your parents as they age? Well, the good news is that my sister, my older sister lives in St. Louis with my parents. I mean, not with them, but they all yeah. live in St. Louis and she's been an incredible support for them mm -hmm. uh, and for me with them. So uh, maybe you should ask my sister. <laughs> <laughs> Follow-up interview. Okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Right. <laughs> All right. Shifting gears. So we obviously at Google think a lot about technology, and my job is to think about how we make sure it's a good place for kids and also that we're providing parents with the tools they need to manage tech. You talk a lot about 
feeling guilty about the amount of screen time, like your son on Sesame with Sesame Street. I think he had one day where he binged a lot of Bob the Builder too. And you talk about that. I'm curious, how do you go about setting boundaries for, for Ben at this moment? And do you have any hard and fast rules? Um, he's not really allowed to hold my phone. I try to keep him away from the phone. He likes to do Wordle with me in the morning. And so I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever word he chooses as the first word. And he weirdly always chooses a five letter word. And I let him press enter when we have figured out the word to keep it going. Um, I've really relaxed on the TV thing as I think happens mm -hmm. as certain, you know, just as they become more demanding, but, um, I don't let him watch much TV during the week. Mm -hmm. Um, it's really a weekend thing. And again, this is another example of, you know, I thought back of how much TV I watched as a kid and look how brilliant I turned out. So, I mean. There you go. <laughs> just um, fine. So he's not allowed to have an iPad unless we're flying on a plane. Um, I don't let him have an iPad at the dinner table or anything like that. Um, but also, you know, and I know a lot of parents use an iPad when they take their kids out to dinner. I don't take both kids out to dinner much. I will, if I take him out to dinner, I will take him someplace that I know will be in and out of in 45 minutes and it's not going to be long and it's not going to be a situation where I need to put him in front of an iPad. But mm -hmm. I understand that sometimes people don't have a choice. You know, you pick your battles. Yeah. I mean, considering you use tech a lot for your career and there's obviously a lot of great advancements there, what are some things that excite you about it as well as, you know, concern you for thinking about your kids? Well, I mean, I'm definitely addicted to my phone and I think I'm setting a terrible example for him. <laughs> and um, that concerns me a lot. Um, I'm hoping that there is some revolution in his generation that is away from social media and all this stuff. I don't necessarily see us all returning to frontier life. <laughs> but um, I don't, you know, I hold out hope or that he'll at least be able to prioritize um, what's important. I think I'm going to be very bossy with him about being on the phone and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's so many trade offs, pros and cons. It's access to information, it also can be something that sucks you in. I think we all struggle as adults <laughs> to, to yeah. manage it all. So shifting gears a little bit, um, you've continued to do so much professionally since having kids um, and while being a single parent. What inspires you to keep going? Well, they inspire me. I mean, you know, you have these, these days, some days are terrible, some days are mm -hmm. great, and most days are kind of a mix between both with your kids. Mm -hmm. And I think what inspires me is... Um, those great moments of joy or what, you know, just a little teeny moment. All I need is a little moment where he's like, daddy, you're my best friend or I love you or whatever. And then it's like, okay, this is yeah. great. Yeah. And this so makes it worth it. Yeah. What, is there anything else you hope to accomplish career wise? I mean, you've kind of, you, I mean, I'm you have a star good. in Hollywood. I, I mean, you going. kind of landed it. I just yeah. wanted to keep going. You know, I don't want to get yeah. canceled. I don't want my show to get canceled, but you never know. Yeah. Yeah. How's well, the wife? It's, it's better. It's okay. better. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. You're, you're doing good. Um, yeah, I know. Right. Um, it so conks out again. Let's just keep going and, and it'll, and we know it'll be back robust. It'll, it'll come back. It'll come back. Yeah. It's part of the challenges of tech. So you can often see hints of, you know, kids' personalities um, when they're very little. Do you see personality traits of yourself in oh. Ben and Lucy? She's She does not miss a thing that happens in a room. I mean, if I'm sitting there with her, if there's two people in the back of the room and she's watching them, she's watching me. So she might wind up being a great multitasker. And Ben... Um, I call him Benis the Menace in the book. 
Um, he's he's a little he's a little wise guy, and I was too. So <laughs> you know, we all as parents, it, it gets thrown back at us. Yeah, uh, getting a little taste of your own medicine a little bit there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I think last question before we shift to the audience Q and A. I'm just curious, what is your greatest hope for Ben and Lucy? I just want them to be happy. I want. I don't want them to hate me. I want them to <laughs> trust me enough to tell me everything. I want to be their person. Uh, and I want them to have friends. Mm. I want them to have good friends. Mm. Yeah. That's great. So I, I want to make sure we save a lot of time for the questions on the Dory, which is audience questions. They're such great ones. So I'll read the, uh, the, the question out for you, and then we can go from there. So this is from Mo. I am a gay mom with a daughter similar in age to Ben. She has recently started asking why she doesn't have a daddy like everyone else in her class. Does this come up for you with Ben? If so, how have you handled it? Um, it's come up a little. He hasn't addressed it directly. But the good news for me, I've, I've, I've come to realize how important it is to have other gay parents in um, my life or his life. And I'm, I'm for, he, there are no, I'm the only gay parent at his nursery school and the only single parent at his nursery school. Mm -hmm. But I am happy to report. I mean, Anderson Cooper is obviously a dear friend of mine and he has two kids and there are some guys down the hall who are gay dads with two, mm -hmm. with one kid. So he sees other gay parents and I just say to him, some families have one daddy. Some families have two daddies. Some families have a daddy and a mommy. Some families have two mommies, mm -hmm. one mommy. So he, and he sees that. So that's a good thing. Yeah, that's great. Um, you, so Ryan asks, any advice for someone who is considering going through surrogacy alone? Just make sure you have a support group around you and also just really save your money. It's expensive mm -hmm. and um, just those two things, mm -hmm. you know, and if okay. you feel like, I mean, you know, and it's an unfair advantage that men have unless women freeze their eggs, you know, if this guy says, you know what, I, feel like in two years I will financially be in a place that I can do this, just then save your money and do it in two years. Yeah. You that's know, great. And sure is right. You don't want to feel overwhelmed when you have your child, then you're adding, you want to, you want to go into this as confidently as you can with mm. the support system and mechanisms of your life. Mm. And you had a really good relationship with your surrogate for Lucy no. You talked about that in the book. I definitely recommend people reading that. Can you tell us a little bit about how you developed that relationship and rapport? Because it seemed like such a beautiful example of, you know, what a gift as well that she gave. Um, you know, I just feel like it's the greatest gift anyone could do for a person. Um, and it's an interesting relationship, especially as a single parent. I mean, the relationship this woman is carrying your child it's not the mother of your child, but they are actually carrying your child. Mm. And uh, it's, you know, you want to be super respectful. You want to look out for them. You want to make sure they have everything they need. You also want to give them their space. And it's complicated. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I'm actually glad that you said that because I have great new pictures of Lucy that I want to send to her right now. <laughs> Yeah, good reminder there. Yeah. <laughs> so Jonathan asks, as a reality TV producer and host, you've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of what can happen when families are put on camera. Now that you have your own family, how would you feel about them appearing on a reality TV show one day? Not great. <laughs> I'm not into it. <laughs> <laughs> you would advise no. <laughs> No go. No go. Okay. <laughs> there we have it, folks. <laughs> Annabelle asks, hey, from Sydney, Andy, 
Can you share how you navigate raising children in a world of heteronormativity and how you help illustrate an inclusive world to your kids? As a queer mom to be, I am really nervous about this. I think it's really about seeking out a support system of other gay parents and just making sure that they are exposed to other gay parents mm. from the jump. And then it, it really will not, it will all, their world will be what their world is. And if their world, it, you know, begins with other gay parents, you can always point to those people mm. and it won't be weird, you know, yeah. and, you know, just make sure those people are around, you know, and if, and if the, you're the only gay parent in your school, then just make sure on the weekends, you know, you have play dates with other kids with um, two moms or, or whatever. Yep. It's great feet. That's great tips. So Netta asks, as a public figure, how do you balance the needs to have a polished professional persona externally with the realities and chaos parenting can sometimes be? How do, how do you decide how much of your authentic self to share versus what is professionally acceptable? Well, I think my whole brand, if you will, is is built around authenticity, I think. Mm. So I think, you know, my show is very much, um, we lean into mistakes. We, you know, I, I overshare. And so I think that I, my brand, I would say that the brand of parenting that I'm showing is authentic parenting. There was a time where I was showing... I wasn't showing him, but you could hear him mm -hmm. having a complete meltdown over me, like cutting his toes wrong. And I would share that because I think that is so relatable. The problem is I started to feel like, you know what? I'm sharing one of his lowest moments in the mm -hmm. day and that's not fair to him. So it might be relatable to other parents. Um, and but I, you know, I have to, I have to kind of, I think that's why it was so fun to write this book because when you write a book and you share stories, it's easier to kind of, I, I don't feel like I'm, you know, selling them out in a way yeah. that I might be if, if it's on social media. Yeah. And it's kind of in the, in the flow of your day. So it's kind of in the context too, in the book. Yeah. So it's really nice. And Maggie asks, what's the one parenting rule you've broken the most since becoming a dad? Oh, I mean, the TV thing, um, uh, I, you know, I've relaxed my views about his eating. Um, you know, he was on a run this summer where he was like coming into my room with ice cream. And instead of absolutely melting down, I, I was like, I took the ice cream one day and I was like, share that with me. And I took a bite and I was like, oh my God, that is so good. And then after that, he was so happy because it was not, and then I just went and put it back in the freezer, you know? Um, so I, you know, it's, it's about how you react to things. Mm. It's very big. Yeah. And you rolled with it. So Julie asks, you travel for work, for work and are out, often for work commitments, relying heavily on child care coverage like many of us. Curious what some of your best caregivers have been like. Well, I mean, I learn from them and I seek out advice from them. I, you know, they're my partners, I feel like. And um, I've learned tricks about how to, I was taking Ben to this Paw Patrol experience uh, on Saturday that he was bitching and moaning about and didn't want to go to. And I was like, you love Paw Patrol. Like I set the <laughs> for us, come on, let's go. And he was really just not wanting to go. And um, my, my nanny said, tell him you're bringing Lucy instead. And I was like, okay, you know what? It's fine that you don't go. I'm going to bring Lucy instead. And I think she's going to love it more than you would love it. So it's totally cool. He ran to the door and <laughs> put his shoes on. So there's a lot of, um, she's very big on reverse, you know, on, you know, doing that reverse psychology 
and it always works on him. Yeah, <laughs> great tip. This is a great yeah. tip. So uh, Amy asks, um, Ben's daily calculations are adorable. Also, I imagine they can be challenging to navigate. Are there specific parenting resources or people that have been particularly helpful to equip you for them? Um, I have, my sister has been amazing. I have a whole network of friends who are moms. Mm -hmm. Some are famous. Some are just very old friends that I've had since high school. And uh, I rely on all of them and I'm so grateful. It's been so essential for me to be able to talk things out with other parents. Um, I can't underestimate how important it's been for me or I can't understate or overstate mm -hmm. how important it's been for me to have um, other parents around gay parents, straight parents mm. to say, this is okay. Don't worry. This happened to me too. Whatever. I mean, yeah. Yeah. That, that's really helpful. So Carl asks similar along similar lines after a long day of toddler negotiations and dealing with their calculations, I love nothing more than to zone out watching my favorite housewives. What do you like to watch when you're just fried from all of the things? You know, I don't watch a lot of TV. I listen to music mm. almost 24 seven around the house. So for me, I will try to read and listen to music or just listen to music. I mean, that's, that's yeah. my tonic. The Grateful Dead is really kind of my, Tonic. Your go-to. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So we're going to shift gears here as we start to wrap up, Andy, and we're going to do a little bit of a rapid fire question, but I'm going to throw in a Google twist for you. We are going to ask you the question and then we're going to see how well Google's Bard generative AI tool predicts your answer. Okay. So we'll add a little, little spice to it. I know you like okay. a good game, right? Yeah, okay. All right. Let's, let's go for it. All right, first question. What's easier, Bravo reunion shows or wrangling your kids out the door? Bravo reunion shows. Bard says, Bravo reunion shows are easier than wrangling my kids out the door because at least with, with the housewives, I can bribe them with snacks and champagne. Well, I can bribe my kids, but yes. So kind yes. of eh, partial, no, partial no, win for Bard. No, they got it right. Okay, okay. Best parenting advice you've received? Don't give them anything. For This is kind of more of a baby thing, but don't give babies something that you then are going to have to take away at some point. Like mm -hmm. my kids didn't have, I would give them a pacifier for an airplane or something like that, but they did not have pacifiers. They didn't have those new cribs that that shake while they sleep. Cause at some point they're going to get addicted to the shaking while they sleep. And then you're going to go to some hotel that doesn't have it and you're going to be screwed. Yeah. And it's going to be a very painful night. That's right. Well, Bard, I think missed on this one. So Bard says, Andy Cohen has received a lot of parenting advice over the years, but he has said that the best piece of advice he's ever received is to enjoy the moment. Okay. <laughs> So far, not really, not really nailing it on this one. All right. Last thing you Googled. Myself. <laughs> Bard says, Andy is a busy man with lots of interests. So it's hard to say for sure what's on his mind at any given moment. But whatever he was Googling, I'm sure it was something juicy. <laughs> I, uh, I Google myself to make, you know, you, it's very interesting. If, I, if you Google yourself, you can see what I said that I'm like going to get in trouble for or what someone said on my show that is making news or what someone said about me. So, or if I'm, or if there's some outrage about something I said, it's very helpful. I mean, you yeah. definitely pick up on it. Yeah. I also scary, right? <laughs> so most use phone app. Instagram. Uh, Bard says, I think Andy Cohen would say that his most used phone app is Instagram. I think it's clear that Instagram is a very important part of Andy Cohen's life. All right, Bart. <laughs> Most guilty pleasure. Um, 
dark chocolate, the housewives, <laughs> edibles. <laughs> and Bard says, Andy says, has said that he enjoys watching tel trashy television, such as Jerry Springer. He's admitted that he knows these shows are bad. i of Jerry Springer <laughs> in my life, Bard. <laughs> We're going to go correct that one. All right. <laughs> Worst ch children's television show. You know what? I mean, there, there's this show called Mighty Express on Netflix. It's so annoying. And they're like, let's make tracks. And they're, it's just these <laughs> tropes are so stupid. It annoys me. Um, and I'm not a Baby Shark fan. I know that's not a show, but we don't allow Baby Shark in this house. Yeah, you, once you go down that track, you're, you're, you can't come back. So <laughs> you're done. Bard says, um, Andy Cohen is known for his quick wit and his willingness to speak his mind. So I would think he would answer the question of worst children's television show in a way that is both honest and humorous. Well, for that's example, a non-answer answer. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and last one. One thing bringing you joy right now. I mean, my kids. Bard said Ben, but we right. we need to update it for Ben and Lucy. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Andy, thank you so much for your time today thank and for you. sharing your insights on parenting. And um, everyone needs to pick up Andy's book and just dig into the delight that it is. And um, we appreciate we appreciate what you're offering to us. So thank you. Thank you so much. This was great. I'm glad my Wi-Fi kicked back in the gear. It was, all, it was part of the adventure. We're Sorry good. about that. <laughs> all good. Thank, thank you. you.